Hello everyone and welcome back to one of our monthly webinars. Thank you for taking your time to join our live webinar tonight. I see there are a few familiar faces, um, few familiar viewers who have attended um, our webinars before. So good to have you here. We hope everyone is staying safe during this difficult and ongoing COVID situation, no matter where you are. As some of you who are regular participants of our monthly webinars, you may know who I am. And for those who are new, my name is Grace and I overlook all the exciting things here that happen at BenQ. I will be your co-host this evening with our main star, Alex Kearns. Now, for those who have joined our initial webinar with Alex back in May this year, she is back for another great session. This time, as per um, the feedback from our viewers, this session will be a very hands-on workshop where Alex will show you her tips on how to edit your animal photographs. She has chosen a handful of photos where she'll share with you later on. And for those who don't know who Alex is, she is one of our master photographers of the uh, with the Australian Institute of Professional Photography, AIPP, winner of countless awards and also our BenQ Global Ambassador. We're delighted to have her back again. Now, Alex's point of view is set squarely on the animal kingdom. She creates remarkable portraits of around 1,300 animals each year, from dogs, cats, reptiles, rats, rabbits, ferrets, and my, my favourite, the quokka back in um, Perth. With 12 years of dedication to professional animal photography, she is an undisputed leader in her niche. Now, as per our previous webinars, feel free to ask any questions throughout the session, but we'll get back to you at the end of the, uh, the Q&A. There will also be a quick survey once the webinar finishes. If you could please provide some of your feedback, that would be greatly appreciated and would also help us for the future webinars. We will include um, some links in the chat for you to find out more information. Otherwise, if you miss it, I'll be sending out a follow-up email um, next week in regards to the webinar and also the links to Alex's website. Now over to Alex. Thanks, Grace. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for joining us. I'm just going to turn my screen share on for you and we can kick off. Okay, I'm just gonna share the whole screen. Uh, Grace, can you kill your screen share for me? Awesome, thank you. And I'll share my whole screen. I found that this might be the best way to switch between the programs that I need to use today. Okay. Ready. So thank you so much for joining me. And Grace, thank you for that introduction. I'm very proud to be a part of the BenQ team and to share with you today my editing tips. I just have a very brief PowerPoint intro to go through a few things before we get into the actual editing. And firstly, what I'm going to share today is a little bit about me and my work. I'm going to talk about why I edit images, what I use to edit, so the software I use and the programs I use, my style of editing, my editing rules, the tools I use the most, and then the live demo. Now, for people new to Photoshop, you'll see how simple editing can be, and you'll get a really strong glimpse of how I choose to edit quickly and simply. People who are more experienced in Photoshop will see how I work up an image and what my mindset is when I'm doing that, what I'm thinking about, and what I'm trying to create. Uh, so and I'll share on these, these things a little bit more in a minute, just on you know, uh, people who are more advanced and, and how I work compared to that, and people who are new to it and how I work compared to that. So I've been a professional pet and animal photographer for over 12 years. I'm also a photography business coach. I'm a philanthropist. I do a lot of work for animal charities because it's what I truly love. My brand ambassador, one of those great brands is BenQ, as Grace mentioned. I lead photographic tours. These have been a little bit restricted thanks to COVID. But I'm leading tours throughout Western Australia. I have seven books with different publishers. One is actually on quokkas, which is awesome because they are one of the best creatures on the planet. I'm an educator, a dog mum, which means I'm owned by three dogs. And I'm also sometimes the cleaner. In my business, I'm the cleaner, the complaints officer, the mailman, photographer, the editor, the whole lot. So if you're self-employed, you'll fully understand uh, how that goes. So my two specialties are working in the studio using artificial light and then photographing wildlife outdoors using natural light. In my studio, studio I photograph anything, any animal I can get my hands on. I photograph about 1,300 animals a year and a 1,000 of those are dogs. The rest are cats, birds, the ferrets, the rabbits, wildlife, other. 
And I photograph outdoors using natural light only. I don't use any artificial light outside. So they're two very different genres of photography. A little bit of my studio work. Uh, all the wildlife creatures in here are rescue animals too. So that's a lot of the dogs and cats are as well. They're mostly pets. The wildlife have all come from rescue centers. I've had the pleasure of visiting all seven continents. And you'll notice that although studio lighting and artificial lighting are very different genres, my images are fairly similar in feel. I like very blank block, generally nothing in the background. I want the backgrounds to be distraction free and clear. And I just want the focus to be on the subject. So sometimes there'll be a pattern in the background for my outdoor work, but it will be even. And I just like obviously the very minimalist look across my studio or my wildlife stuff. Not a lot of man-made influences in the shots if I can help it. And just block colors using the sky patterns of the trees behind the subject to you know make that background just nice and simple and plain these uh, pictures were from uh, the last ones were from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka these are from the Galapagos and the first ones are from the Antarctic so same thing again these backgrounds are very blank even in this shot the iguana at the top is on a white background so is the bird next to it the frigate and down the bottom there's a frigate bird on a white background as well that's just the sky it was a bright but overcast sky. So it gives me almost that studio kind of look. Apart from the lighting on the subject, the background gives that feel. Why do I edit personally? It's part of my self auditing process. And what that means is when I'm going through my photos, I take a lot of pictures. I was out today doing a shoot for the Perth Zoo. I was there for two and a half hours. I probably took 4,000 photos and I now have to cull those. And that was maybe 12 subjects. And I have to go through and so I'll start my editing process way before I've even downloaded and opened up my editing software. First thing I do is think, right, how many images, you know, or shots of each animal should I provide my client or, you know, the person that I'm shooting for? So say 12 subjects today, 5,000, 4, 5,000 images. I might give them, I might go for five hero shots of each animal and there may be 10 others. So 15 pictures of each animal times 12. So a very small portion of the overall numbers of pictures I took. And I'm going to show you in a sec how I actually pick and choose because, you know, you can, you can spend all day trying to work out which photo. And sometimes I still agonize over oh, this one or this one. They're so similar. There's no point doing both. Which one? Self-auditing is also to me, if it's not 100% sharp, don't show it. It's that culling process, knowing when to put photos out and when not to, and when one will say everything as opposed to saying it with 100 images. So it's just part of that learning. I learned that as I went. The photos I used to take in the beginning of my career, I mean, now I cringe. I'm like, wow, they're not really very good. But I learned, I looked and I was like, right, there's something in the background. Next time I need to shoot that tighter or edit it out and move forward from that. I also want certain results in my photos. When I'm taking that picture, I have a, an image in my mind's eye that I want to create, I suppose. And when I'm taking that shot, sometimes I'm not quite getting it in the actual photo, I do have to edit to achieve the mind's eye result, that clean background sometimes, or removing an element that I don't want in there. Removing distractions. Sometimes there's just no way I can shoot and not get a bit of someone's shoe or another animal popping in. You know, quokkas, for example, they like to hang out together, jump on each other and run around. Sometimes there's other elements in those pictures. Um, animal poop quite often is in photos. You don't want that in your final shot. You know, you either move it out to start with, or if you can't, you've got to take it out later. I use editing to fix my colors and my exposure. I try to get it as right as I can in camera because it saves me you know, double handling with a lot of editing time later. But admittedly, all my photos get a little bit of a tweak in editing, so I can't help myself. So there's always something I fix and sometimes color and exposure, they're two of those things. And sometimes just to straighten my horizon, something might be happening really fast in front of me. The animals might be jumping or fighting or something's kicking off. I have to get that shot in that exact moment. And sometimes when doing that, I'm a little bit too excited and I have the camera on a tilt and I've got, you know, a wonky horizon. So I straighten that up and I want to make sure my pictures are ready for print and online accuracy. I want to make sure that what I see and how I want that photo to look is what's going to be printed and how it's going to go out there to the public. So for instance, this is a very vibrant photograph. It's called Blue Clams. It's got a lot of color saturation. With this, when this is printed or it goes out online, I wanna make sure that it's replicated in exactly the same way. And you can see if I switch between these screens, 
there isn't any shift in the colors of this photo when it was printed on the cover of this magazine back in 2013. Actually, interesting too, I'll tell you on this shot, this is pretty much out of camera on a budget $350 Canon camera at the time. And the only thing I've edited is down the very bottom, down where you can see my mouse, there's a tiny bit of like a little tiny strip of black plastic. These clams were actually growing on plastic um, gridded material and that, that kind of filled it all with you know, their growth and this the sediment from the ocean and stuff like that. And they're in a big tank. And so there's a tiny, tiny little bit of plastic there that I just colored out. Other than that, it is literally straight out of camera. The one thing with editing animal images, if you're going to enter any in competitions, make sure you check the rules because some of the rules are very specific about removing any original elements or even cropping something out or going too far with changing, you know, colors and tones and you know, all sorts of things. General editing of removing dust spots, little tiny flecks you get on your lens that turn up in your shots. I'm guilty of that quite a lot. Uh, removing those and just little blemishes and stuff are okay, but check the rules because I've seen um, a lot of competitions where people get kicked out because the photo is beautiful, but they've removed something that they shouldn't have done according to the rules. So what do I use to edit? I use two main software programs. I use Adobe Bridge and I use Photoshop. I don't use Lightroom. Um, just I'm a bit of a creature of habit. These are what I've always used. I tend to do now what I've always done. So uh, is that that thing you can't teach an old of new tricks? Um, I'm sure I can learn a new trick, but I just love using what I what I know and what I'm familiar with. And I'm always so time poor generally because I, I have a lot of things on, but I don't want to learn something new. I've got my ways of doing things within these systems. And I use a BenQ monitor to edit as well, because as I said, I want everything that I see on the screen I want to be 110% sure that when I print, that's also what I'm going to get. And with a dedicated color calibrated photography monitor, what I see on screen comes back in print exactly the same. So it's reliable and it gives me that peace of mind, especially printing for clients or, you know, sending that photo to a magazine. Didn't want it to come out kind of pink or with a weird hue to it. I would describe my editing style as simple. It is very simple. I'm self-taught. So... What does that mean really? It means in the beginning, I made it up as I went along. And I think that's good for people to know. I'm self-taught in photography as well. And I have an incredible career filled with amazing experiences. I'm still you know, hopeful there's a lot more to come. Being self-taught really means you're making it up as you go. And what I do with that is if I do something, and this is just way bigger than editing, if I do something in my business or in my editing and it looks wrong, or I can tell it's you know, not quite worked out, I wind it back a bit and I go and do something else. And that's how I learn through teaching myself. Trial and error. Oh, that looks great. That editing worked out really well. Or oh, that editing's too heavy handed. And I need to wind it back a bit. I also find my editing being nice and simple. It's easiest for me and it saves me time. I just have a few certain things I do very simply and quickly. And generally then my photos are done. I don't spend hours and hours editing the pictures. But I'm also not creating composites. I'm not trying to edit up whimsical pictures you know it says mad people out there with mad talent at that sort of stuff amazing graphic design combined with photography and editing and it's masterful that's not what I do I've just got my animal subject and I'm just trying to clean it up you know take something out remove a distraction and all those things that I mentioned and I also don't want to change the integrity of my animal subject and I find the beauty of animal photography is we can't over edit as we do change the integrity of the subject we can't tweak the color so much that we make it pink and that bird should be you know, blue because people look at that and go, this, there's no pink kingfisher, the kingfisher is blue. So I kind of try and always make sure that the editing is done so that you can't quite tell that I've done it. And you know, a photo like this, this picture was actually taken in camera. I, pretty, I shot the actual frame like that, I haven't cropped at all. And then I've probably just you know, darkened a few areas to highlight some of the shadows and other than that, that's pretty much it. There were zero distractions in this photo to start with. So if you can get it as right in camera as you can, save you a lot of time out the other end. My editing rules, these are my homegrown editing rules, and this is how I edit. There's no right or wrong way. So if you watch this and you're like, I don't do it like that, great. There are actually a million ways to do everything. There are a million ways to use a fork. You know, everything we do every day can be done differently. There are just different ways, and there are many ways to get the same result. And um, excuse my typo there, if you, and tell, if you can tell that it's been done, undo it and start again with less. If I edit and I can tell that I've darkened the area too much, 
I undo, undo until I can tell that it's been changed slightly, but it looks natural. That's the key to editing. If it looks too edited, you've overdone it. And if you can tell it's been done, you need to just wind it back a little bit and just make sure it looks natural, especially with outdoor wildlife photographs. Natural is key. You don't want to change the integrity of the subject or the integrity of the image as well. Now, when I'm editing in Photoshop, I'll show you in a minute how I open my and select my photos in Adobe Bridge and then how I open them in Photoshop as well. And I'm actually going to use raw files today so you can see how they come out of the camera as well. Talk about trying to get it right in camera. Sometimes I don't. I mostly use very, very few tools. Now, I teach a, a full day wildlife photography workshop too. And someone once said to me, put their hand up and said, Alex, why don't they just make a camera with three buttons? Because that's all you use. And I was like, fair point. They make the Alex camera. This is kind of the same thing. Photoshop has a million functions. I mostly use these. The crop tool to crop the picture how I want. The clone tool to color something out or fill a gap with some fur where I need to. Dodge and burn. Uh, this is adding contrast to shadows or making them lighter or, or darker. And I mostly use the contrast version. This like everything to get a little bit of contrast over it. And the coloring in tool, the color tool brush and the sharpen tool, which I use very minimally. You can over sharpen. I'll do a live demo of that and show you how that looks. If you over sharpen, you can tell it looks scratchy. And that's where people, you know, uh, photography judges, I do a lot of judging. I can look at an image and I can tell straight away what editing people have done on it. Because over sharpening is a big one that, that people quite often make a mistake in. And this is where they are. So in Photoshop, we've got the little crisscross crop fil filter or crop button. We've got the color brush, the clone stamp, the little hand is the, um, for dodge and burn, that would be burn. Burn is darker, dodge is lighter. Dodge is a, a little icon that you click, comes up under there. And sharpen is in the filter menu under unsharp mask. And I use that as well. So that's what my, um, my main ele elements, go-to elements of Photoshop are very simple. Five things, pretty much it. So I'm going to skip now to the live demo. I'm just going to open up my... Adobe Bridge. So when I download my photos, I create a folder on my computer and I drag them all in there. It's obviously not one of my photos on the screen. And I drag them all into the folder and then I open up Adobe Bridge and this is how all the files look. So say this is a mix of shoots from various locations. I can see Africa in there, Sri Lanka, Kangaroo Island, and there's probably a few. I think there's some quokkas in here as well down the end. These are all raw files and this is how they come up in Adobe Bridge. So first thing I'd do is make them bigger so I can see them a little bit better. And then I wanna go through and select the photos I'd like to edit. So let's do a few. So I'm gonna select this one. I'm just gonna hold down the control key. And as I click, it'll pick the pictures that I want to choose. And what I normally do is if I get a range of photos in a row, so I'm gonna skip down to an actual series that I've shot and just show you how I pick and choose. Okay, so this is a great example. This, um, lion cub laying on the tree in the Serengeti. So I'm gonna go here. Now I'm looking for, I've got great white sky there. I've shot up into the sky, I'm on the Jeep and I've managed to just get zero background, which is great. I'm looking for catch lights in the eye, nice sharp eyes. See, these all look very similar. These eight photos look very similar, but wait, there's more. Now you can see I've zoomed out a little bit and now the contrast is a bit darker. And I'm getting like, there's a mountain, kind of not a mountain, but like a hill thing. So I'm getting pretty flat, but like a little raised hill in the background. So in these shots, I can see that bit of tree hanging down there. It's a bit distracting. So I'd keep looking and I'd go through and I'd think, right, so far there's the close up, there's the pullback shot with the tree. I've gone in close again. And yeah, there's all, oh, look, that's this one here um, down the bottom, five, eight, seven, eight. It's probably a bird flying through there. So if I chose that one, that would have to go because it, it's like a, little smudge on the screen. I get to the end and I just have a look at what I got. Okay, now she's turned her head. Right, so out of that, there's a few different poses. Let's say the first ones where I had the close up, the pull back of the tree and looking to the side. So I'm gonna pick the best one that I think looks the best out of each of those. So this is what I'll be doing today from my photos, my 4,000 photos from the zoo. So I go through here. Now, some of these she's looking right at me, particularly like this one. Make it a bit bigger so you guys can see. And then in some, she slightly starts looking away. So see here, she's kind of, I feel like this one, she's looking right at me and that looks pretty sharp. Now, when I open this, if it's not sharp, 100% sharp in the eyes, 98% sharp in the eyes, I might go back and pick the other one either side. 
So I remember I look at nine, this is 5842, I'll go and get 5841 or 5843 and open those. Because quite often when I shoot, sometimes, you know, the first time you see something and you lock onto that animal, oh my goodness, like there's a lion in a tree. We're, we're 10 meters away from it. That's amazing. Your heart rate's going. And I'm like, wow, get the shot. And sometimes it takes me a while to calm down, even though I'm not physically looking like I'm freaking out. I'm taking the photos and I'm doing the burst. These are super fast shots. Um, I have a new camera that can shoot 30 frames a second, super quick. So if I'm even breathing while I'm shooting, I'm moving a tiny bit. There could be a bit of wind, you know, it could be, um, the animal could be slightly moving. It's going to be blurry. So sometimes I'm trying to lock on, shoot, shoot, shoot. I'm shooting so fast, I'll go through 15 images in the series and I'm like slightly blurry, slightly blurry. Number 15 is locked on, but that sometimes I have to do this process to go through and find the one that is that pin sharp one. So let's go with 5842 there. Going to scroll down a little bit to laying here with the, the branch kind of as a pillow. And uh, let's see, these look kind of nice. Let's go with this one, the tails in the shot. That's great. And already I know, as I look at this, I start thinking about what I'm gonna do with it. I love the white background. I don't mind the bit of the hill but I don't like how these bits of wood are cut off at the bottom because they, you know, people then look at that and it takes your eye down there and you think, oh, what's down there? Don't want you to think that. So I'm going to take those out and I'll probably lighten it a little bit. So already I'm starting to think about what do I need to do to make this the picture I see in my mind's eye. And then maybe one of these as well, just because they're there. Let's see. Like I said, normally my best shots are near the end of the series because the first few, I wasn't quite paying attention. Actually, I'll skip to the looking sideways ones at the bottom. Uh, let's go with, yeah, these are quite, I mean, the, the stick is in there, but she's been using it as a pillow, so let's go with those. Then from here in Bridge, I can either click, double click, or I can right click, and I can open with Adobe Photoshop. I'm going to click that, and now they're going to pop open in Camera Raw in Photoshop, and I get to do extra extra tweaks here before I open them for to go through my cropping, my cloning, my sharpening, all that thing. So this is how they now look. So I can zoom in here and check other eyes sharp. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Good choice, guys. Thanks for your help with that one. And got lucky because sometimes I cry. I'm like, oh no, it's so good and it's blurry. It's not good. A lot of digital noise in this one. This is a late, I can see, see how the eyes are sharp, but they're a bit, there's grain in it. So shooting late afternoon, this was sunset. So I could put this through um, a topaz denoise software, which is amazing and get rid of that. The other thing I'll just point out too, and this is something to watch when you're shooting against a bright background. You see along the hairline, see it's slightly blue. Now it's chromatic aberration. It's quite often blue or pink. So sometimes I'll try and take that out. If I zoom it right out and it's small, you might not notice, but quite often around trees, you'll see this green tree and a blue sky or white sky and blue fringing or pink fringing around the edge. It's just the way that the the bright sky has um, been impacted through the lens. So the light reflecting off, I'm sure, some piece of glass that's in there. So I'll zoom back out to it's full size. So for this one, I feel like it's a bit uh, blue, green, gray. So I'm going to warm it up a bit. So there's the things I use here, there's some temperature sliders, they change color. And this is what I'm talking about where if you've overdone it, you know. So, okay, lines don't look like that, way oversaturated. So I'll go to where, you know, and lines don't look blue. So I go and find the point where I think in my mind's eye, well, I was there, what did this line look like? So this is a cooler photo, a cooler color, and this is a warmer color. Blue is cool and yellow is warm. So I'd probably go to, drag it down a bit, maybe about there. Not too blue, but it's not getting too yellow orange either. There's also a green and pink one as well. Sometimes I do a little bit of this. Right. Well, clearly, now this is great for like peacocks. They are blue and green, so you um, you get to choose the a bit more, add a bit more to the blue, a bit more to the green, and the feathers look amazing. But lines aren't green, and nor are they pink. So I'll just kind of again, I'll, I'll try and put the see there. It's too pink. Very subtle shifts, and there it looks mm, starting to look. I don't want to get it too green. Then I use the exposure slider. This makes it brighter or darker. And this is the beauty of shooting in camera raw. You have this opportunity. If this photo looked like this, um, now I can make that brighter when I'm using my camera as I'm shooting, but if I forgot to change the setting, I can basically drag this exposure slider and bring it back. And I want it back so it's not you know, too blown out. I want to be able to see the detail, but I also want it to look like it's nicely exposed, not too bright, not too dark, and probably about there. And that's pretty much all of these that I use. There are a lot of different menus in here. Uh, if I want to do a very specific thing, I Google it and I know how to 
make backgrounds, you know, clear, crop things into a circle, <clears throat> do black and whites, all that sort of stuff. But my day-to-day -day editing, I don't do any of that. This is all I do. And occasionally I might give it this next tool down, this contrast tool, this little slider here. It, you know, takes kind of um, emphasizes shadows, I guess, anything black it emphasizes. So it adds contrast, see it's adding kind of darkness. And again, it's zero is where it starts. I might go up five. That one's done. Now go to the next one. So straight away, same thing. She's a bit too dark. So firstly, I'd brighten her to where I wanted her to be. And I see straight away too, I'm losing the hills as I dark, as I lighten, are disappearing, that little hills disappearing, which is not a bad thing because it was okay that it's in there, but it didn't really add much. So I don't want her to be, where was she at zero? She was originally around here. I wanted to be a bit brighter, maybe there. And then I want to go, okay, let's make her a tiny bit. Don't want her too blue. Don't want her too warm. I want to find that sweet spot where she looks just right. And then I go, you know, I can even go here. And this one was 605 and 19. I can actually just look at what the numbers were for the color tone that I used and just check if it works the same. So 605, it's about not far off there. Yeah, see, I think I don't think that looks good. So I'm going to actually do it just separate. But sometimes you can refer off another picture. Sometimes you're just better off doing what you think. Looks good. Here she looks a bit green to me. Make it a bit pinker and then go back. But I do want to make sure that these two pictures, when I open them, because it's the same subject, don't have a massive shift in the color. That look doesn't look too bad. Maybe a bit yellow. See. And then the third, the third one. This is very blue. The exposure is probably pretty good. Maybe I'll make it a tiny bit brighter. There you go, up a tiny bit, and just make her a bit warmer. And maybe a tiny bit of contrast. That's it. Now I'm going to select all three. I just use the shift key, or you can go up here and click select all, and then open images and it's going to open these three pictures in Photoshop. So if I dump 4,000 photos into that Adobe Bridge file, that's how I go through. Photoshop these days, um, and because I have a very high speed, amazing computer that um, really looks after me, and I'm using the link to the monitor, my BenQ monitor, I can open 100 files at a time. Now I've had people say, oh, you should only open 10 at a time as your computer can crash. Mine can cope with that. So I can pick out a, about 100 images and open them, and then I'll do all those sliders, then I'll hit go, and it opens them all up. So here, it's opened them all up one after the other. Take out the one after the other. Um, one, two, three. So really, I can see this one looks really pretty good. The color on this looks a bit flat compared to the other one. And the middle one looks a bit, probably a bit, um, a bit too rich. So I can work on that. So first thing I do, let's use the crop tool. Is there anything I want to crop in this shot? So I go to my little crop tool on the left, the two little boxes that crisscross. And I might make this either, um, I usually go with, if it's just for online stuff or for a small print or something, you know, 12 inches by eight inches or eight inches by 10 inches. 12 by eight inches is this whole frame. So if I put in here 12 inches as the, by eight inches up here in the crop size, and I then drag the little crop box, you see it's filling the whole frame. That's 12 by eight. If I did, 10 by eight, that crops it a bit shorter. So I'll get out of that. So sometimes I like a, a shorter photo, I crop a bit out. Sometimes I like the whole thing um, to be in there. I like the space. So yeah, so this is the toilet. Now I feel that if I crop it here, I don't feel like that's an, I love all that negative space. I like that big space. So I'm gonna go 12 by eight because for this photo, it's just, again, my uh, mind's eye result. I want the whole thing, but She's kind of going down the slope. I feel like she's laying on the tree branch, but the tree branch down here is going down the hill. So I'm just down the bottom here, bottom uh, right corner. And if you can see that my little mouse has done a U-shaped thing like this. I'm just going to hold down and turn. And this is me now cropping, trying to line up the branch. It's, you know, branch is wonky, but trying to line up with one of those grid lines that's, that's appeared and make it a bit straighter. So maybe about there. Now I'm losing part of her her hip and butt over here. I don't really mind so much going on. And if I want to get rid of the dark bits of this tree, look down the bottom, they're kind of distracting. That one's probably not too bad. That one there, I'll just come in a little bit and try and take them out. Double click. And now I've cropped her nice and straight. Now I might go, mm, you know what? I've cropped out too much butt, but I'm actually just going to do a much closer crop. I might crop right in. You can pretty much crop out about a third of the image without losing resolution on the rest. You can remove a third, the other two thirds depends on how big you'd like to go. What you can't do, so if I cropped here, this picture would still be would still be fine. Resolution wise, it's still nice and sharp and looks good. But if I undo that and I crop, I was like, wow, I just want a picture of her eye and I'm going to crop like this. 
and basically going in and taking that very small section and then stretching it back out over the same space. And that's when it pixelates. You'll see like, as if I do that, when I zoom in, you'll see that the quality, see it's all speckly and you know, I'm trying to stretch it out. There's some more chromatic aberration, the pinky colored one down there, great. Joy of shooting against bright sky. Yeah, see how it it just the whole thing. Even though it was a, not well, it was sharp, but it was a bit grainy. Now it just it looks a bit stretched. I can tell that I've gone in and stretched it. So whereas here doesn't look like that. If I zoom in, doesn't look like that at all. So I've cropped it. Right. What next? Let's give a little bit of contrast using the burn tool, the little hand. Um, it's about the tenth one down on the left. So I'm going to grab that. And up here you can pick certain size brushes. You just want a soft brush. Now my Photoshop's being silly and it's not showing the size of the brush, but you can see the little plus moving around. But normally um, when it's playing the game, it shows me a brush as well, shows me whether it's really small or really big. This one's, um, let's go for one that's 190 pixels, 464 pixels. This brush would be about this big. And because I'm going to do it quickly and lazily, I just want to add a bit of contrast to the dark bits of this shot. So I'm going to run it over, see how this is getting yeah, it's getting darker. Now that's a bit too much. I'm just going to go over it once, over it here, then make the brush very small and go over her eyes just to darken. I can even go right in and just, just want to darken the shadows a bit. She's got eye makeup on. And then follow the dark lines. It's very subtle, but I'm just adding some extra contrast to these areas. I might go this a bit there. So if I do this bit, see now you can tell there's a weird kind of colored blob on her head. So I'd be like, well, oh, undo that. That didn't work. Go up here to the edit and undo. Edit, step back and step back. And probably one more, step back, there you go. So that undoes it. There's also a shortcut you can use. Oh, I'm do the mouth again, in the ears, bit of that. And I'm just zooming in and out. Okay, so now she's got that nice, darker, sharper face. I could make the brush really big again and just do a quick pan along her body. So now she's just very slightly changing in the darkness. Now, when I look at this photo, I think she looks great. You can't see the chromatic aberration very well unless you zoom in. So we might get away with this, you know, online. If we printed it, we'd probably have to try and edit that out. But what's bothering me is this big dark patch and this little dark bit here, maybe even this bit here. So I'm gonna try and clone that out. Now, when you clone, you have to grab a part of the picture that's already there and basically put it over the top of the bit you want to get rid of. It's like matching it. You can do this a lot of different ways. The way I do it is using the clone tool. Sorry, shot my button. And so I'm going to go to the clone tool. It's the one that looks like a little stamp. Now it's about three, four, six, eight down on the left. And again, I will get, it'll give me a certain size brush. So wherever I put this cross and click the Alt button, see it makes it like a target. So if I put it here and click Alt, now, wherever I put this brush up here, it'll do that because I clicked it here, it'll paint her eye. You can see it moving. You can see the little cross moving where I originally clicked. There's two crosses on here. They're mirroring each other. So if you want eye in the sky, awesome. So down here, I'm going to pick like this bit of wood here and I'm going to color it in down here. So I'm going to select this bit here. And if you keep your eye where my little cursor is here, you'll see as I start coloring down here, see the cross and now that's filling that in. Then the key is to make sure you can't see a pattern repeated, right? I can see here that little, a little curve of a bit of wood and a curve of a bit of wood. So now I'll grab this bit and I'll put that over there. There, now it's, it's completely gone. This one's gonna be harder because this is a big section to match. Like you can see if I grab something from over here and then color it in, you're gonna be able to tell it's come from the other side and it's slightly the wrong tone. You can see that that repeated pattern is over here. So I might leave it there and I might go right and I'll add a bit of this over the top and then a bit of that. And I just do it a few different times to try and make sure it doesn't look like it's repeated. I can even up the top here, change the opacity of this brush. So right now it's at 100%. So this eye comes out 100% dark. You know, that's what I'm getting. If I make the opacity 50%, well, this is 45, you'll see the eye is only, it's, it's faded because it's only 45% of the opacity. So if I 45% this dark bit and put some of that over here, kind of can start to make it the right, just, I'm just selecting bits and just coloring over other bits. You try and try and make sure you can't tell it came from over here. It's just part of the log, undo that. Undo, I undid then because I looked like a, I'd had two big dark blobs. You could tell I was kind of, I'd, I'd done something to it. And I may leave it there. Now this is where you can get caught because I could spend an hour just trying to get that to look how I think it looks perfect. There's a point where you have to stop. So what I do now is I'd go back to my little hand 
um, I want to dodge in some shadows. So I just run the dodge tool. See, so it just went a bit darker. I just put a bit of that down there. And now that looks a bit more woody with some different shade in there. And then this little line across here, same thing. I just grab the clone tool. I make it 100% opacity because I want the thing to be fully full opacity. And I just kind of paint it in and then go back over it to make sure you can't till I've repeated it from somewhere. Go forwards and back, pick that bit and just kind of color it in till it's gone. And that's probably all I'd do for that. I'd be like, right, that one's done. I'd just save it. And quite often when I save, I sometimes put ED at the end of the file name. So it's the image name and ED. And then I know that's the edited version. Then I'd add a logo and that picture's done. Perhaps resize it for social media and it's good to go. If I go back to my selection, let's pick something else other than that. I'm gonna go back up the top. Okay, so this photo here of this bird. So a lot of this is trying to shoot as right as I can from the start. So straight away I know I'd get rid of this branch and I'd probably try and crop this bird to just get rid of the branch it's sitting on. It's That's just really, really basic editing. I'll show you a way that you can get rid of a branch super quick other than cloning. So I'll bring this up and then I'll do a more complex one so you can see that too. So I've just, um, I selected it and I've just opened it in camera raw. I just double clicked and it's opened. Um, let's make it a bit bigger. All right, so I wanna go to my sliders. It looks pretty good color wise. It's a brown bird, so I don't wanna make it blue or too, you know, too yellow. I'll probably keep it about there. I actually think the color's pretty good. This was a bird in Sri Lanka, bit of contrast. What was that, 10 seconds? Open it up. Now I've got this big stick. You can tell it'd be a much better photo if that's gone. This is where I get super lazy because I'm time poor and this works. I've gone over here to the little paintbrush. It's a coloring in tool. And down the bottom here are two little white squares. Whatever the top one is, is what color the brush will be. So I can go around and I can, again, I've got my finger on the Alt button. Here's my mouse. If I put, push Alt and click, you watch this little color thing, this little box down here on the left-hand side. It's changing because I'm picking these colors. Down here, it's a bit gray. You can do yellow in the eye. You don't want to do that because otherwise we're going to get that. This is what does colors in. So I'm going to pick this background over here and now I'll take out the tree. Now I can already see that there's um, this color, this background is not pure white. It's very different pale shades of gray. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I can see already here there's kind of a line because this background here isn't the same as the color around here. So what I do in that case is I pick really close to the tree and I just make sure that I'm getting the background that's nearest to it. So I pick here and then color here. So unlike clone where it's copying, this is just picking a color and then coloring it in. Basic, it's just coloring in. Um, now you could crop this out as well, I suppose. See, I can start to see still there's some gray, big gray, kind of very pale gray area here, but I'll have to fix that because otherwise when I print it, there'll be a big gray splodge. So color that out, great. Then to get rid of gray splodge, I'm still in the coloring in tool, go up to the opacity again, might make it 43%. What that means is if I pick this color over here, and I run it over here, it's only 43% the density of that color, it's not. And that's when I just run it over the edges of that area. So I'm picking here, running over here, picking here, running over here. Just try, I'm trying to, it's blending. Just trying to like, imagine if you painted a, a blue stripe and then a light dark blue and a light blue stripe, and you wanna blend them and you're put, putting water over the edges to make it a bit more opaque to blend them together. It's kind of what you're doing here. Color in, color in, and that's pretty much Go down the bottom a bit. I'm just going to do the whole thing to make sure the whole background's even. That's it. And then be like, right, don't like this stick. Could have that in there. It's part of the story. It actually looks, I'm into my crop tool now. I'm going to crop it because this has way too much space. Remember, I can take out about a third. So I could probably go to, you know, about here without losing any quality because I, I shoot in big file sizes. But instead, let's make it, this is a landscape layout. Let's click and make it portrait. And let's go here. And I don't mind if I lose that, I'm gonna turn it. So I wanna fit as much of the bird in as I can. I'm trying to get rid of this stick thing. So let's go over here, make it bigger, 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 because I want it to be big, so I don't wanna lose too much resolution of the bird. Oh, and down here, if I go right in here, zoom back out, I've got this little section down here where I've missed, I've, I've cropped out the edge and I've got white background. So let's go to the clone tool, small brush. Okay, you can see my brush is down here on the feathers. I'm gonna click this feather. And I'm going to go down here and match. And now it's repeating whatever is above it. So I can actually color back in these little lines. The best job, but you get the idea. I've done it super quick. And then at the end, 
color down that bit there. And then I'll be like, mm, see, I know straight away looking at that, I know that I've done that. So I might then um, just even do a slightly tighter crop because that's going to bother me. And also the parallel lines are on the angle. So I'm just going to get rid of them. I don't like that. It's setting off my OCD. I want it to be nice and bigger. See how that looks better straight away. Those lines are now gone. Um, just also then might go right. Anything distracting in this image, this little brown thing, I might use the clone tool to get rid of that. So and pick right next to it, that this little dot here, pick next to it, gone, pick next to it, and gone, and just get rid of those. And then just what where's our little contrast tool? Our burn tool. And I'm putting contrast here. The feathers are getting slightly darker, dark down the bottom. That's it. And then I'd save. It's done. And I go in and put edited at the end of the photo. That's literally as simple as it can be. They're the tools I use. I'll do another one. Um, let's do a more complex one where I actually have to edit out stuff. You can even see in these, all right, this one's pretty, pretty good. These two are pretty good ones. Here's a condor and a baby elephant. They're both in Sri Lanka. I actually tell a lie, one was in Africa, one's in Sri Lanka. So I just opened them. That was selected them in bridge, opened them up in the camera raw slider. So the condor straight away, it's a bit washed out and it's a bit blue. So we need to warm it up a little bit. Now this bird's black, so I want it to make sure it stays black, not like that. So again, I'm trying to find that sweet spot between blue and too bright, Put about there. I feel like it's a bit too bright. So I'm just gonna drop this down. If I go too far, you lose detail. So I wanna make sure it's got nice contrast. So maybe a bit of exposure for this front stuff that's quite bright and then a little bit of contrast. So you can see the feathers getting darker. Just a really tiny hint of contrast. That's that one. Then I'm going to go to the second one. All right. So straight away, I know with this one, I don't want the water in there. This one's going to be a straight crop across the top. That's literally it to get this picture ready to go. So this it was also, I feel like this is a bit cold. It's a bit blue green. It needs a bit more yellow pink. So a bit warmer because well, it's gray, but just a bit warmer. Maybe a bit more, not too much pink. Just get away from the green and a little bit of contrast. So that tiny little jump, that tiny little jump. Again, too much, not enough. Um, I'm gonna show you guys the sharpening tool on one of these two, just to show you when it can go wrong. So I'll open this up. I can see some uh, Q and A questions coming in. I'll uh, make sure I answer those at the end so I can open them up and have a look. Baby elephant, right. So first thing of this, love the baby elephant. It's I've focused on the head, thankfully, actually not the butt, the head's in focus and it blurs as it comes forward. But don't like that top bit. One, it's on an angle. So if I did keep it, I would straighten this photo. I'd go to my crop tool, I'd crop in landscape, and I'd just tilt. So what I'm doing, as I was doing that, I'm trying to line this line up with the top of the frame, this the horizon line. So I'd crop it so it was at least relatively straight. Even then, the, these white bits are annoying me. And, you know, it's because what happens is I just want people to look at the elephant. I don't want them to go up here and look at the white bits of stuff. So instead... I'm going to try, if I try and crop even this orangey color out, it's going to be too close to baby's head. All right, so see if I do this, it's probably feeling a little bit close to here. So before I do that, I'm going to do one of my cheat moves. I'm going to get the coloring in tool and I'm going to do a big brush. It's on 495. So if it was showing how big the brush was right now, it's just showing across, but it'd be about this big. And I'm going to select this. I'm going to put it at 43% at opacity. I'm going to select this green this blurry green and color some of this in at the top, but make it all splotchy like that green section at the top. So I'm get a bit of that, see how it's coloring it in? Get a bit of that. So I'm just coloring in the color, pick this green down here, put a bit of that there, a bit of dark green in there, a bit in there, just to get rid of that pinky color. And by mixing up, if I do one color, it gets a bit, you can tell, like you can start to tell, see it's all the same. It's starting to look actually like I've painted it. So instead, I want to make sure I mix it up with different sections. I have some different shades and tones in there as I'm doing it. And I'm just going to go all the way along. I could do the whole thing, but I think I feel like it's stronger if I actually just, I'm just blending this out a little bit, stronger if I just um, mix it up a little bit and then crop. Now these green lines, even they bother me, these dark green lines here. So I'll go over here and get a bit of that, blend it over them a bit. Get that there. Be careful not to go over the subject because otherwise I'm going to colour in green. So I don't want to do that, undo. The fact it's undoing, I'm using shortcut keys. I think control or Z, I can undo really quickly. Um, I just learned the little click the buttons or edit, um, undo. 
or redo. Step back, you can go forwards or backwards in here if you want to undo or redo. I use those quite a lot. And I think at the moment it's pretty much limitless to how many undos you can do. It used to be you could only go back like 10 moves. You did lots of cloning 10 times and clicked it. You could only go back a certain number. Now it's pretty good. You can go back as many as you want. So now I've got a bit more room to go up there. I'm going to get as much of this in as I want because the more I crop out, the less resolution my picture will have. And then I can just see on this left-hand top corner still a little bit of blue. Let's grab some green. That's pretty much it. Then if I was being really pedantic, and I probably would, the green, there's a blob here in the middle, a dark blob. This is grass. But let's get our clone tool. Let's go to 50% opacity. So this is the little stamp. I'm going to select the grass from, I've got to select grass from a similar sort of plane, a similar area, because this is a certain blur here. Um, at the moment, it looks like it's the clone tool is on the elephant. I'm coloring the elephant, <laughs> elephant in. So let's go over here and then put that over here. And I'm just, because it's at a lower opacity, let's go around it a bit, it will disappear. That should still look like you'll never know. You'd never know that was taken out. And that's pretty much good to go. Again, you could go to, you could go forever. There's a dark bit here. There's a bit of something here. I have to know when to stop. It was one of my self-auditing things I had to learn. We can really get in our own way with this sort of stuff. And, you know, oh, it's not perfect. You know what? Everyone would just look at this and go, oh, how cute. While I was talking then, I was just using the, the burn tool and I was darkening it a bit, but I didn't like, I did too much on the butt. I felt like the butt was too dark. So I also did the body. I went over here and then I just, see, so yeah, I feel like the butt doesn't mean it's too dark. And then maybe just along the bottom. That one is done. With the condor, I'm just going to do a quick edit and a sharpen for you and show, show what happens if you over sharpen. Actually, I'll show on this one. It's probably a good example. So this is just saving. So I'm going to make it bigger in the screen so you can see. Say I wanted to make the Ellie a little bit sharper. Yes, good back shot. Um, up here under filter, there's a menu that says sharpen. Again, I play around with all these, but I don't use them for my main work. They're just for fun if I'm mucking around. Under sharpen, the final one says unsharp mask. And this is a little sharpen box and tool. Now, if you watch this area of the elephant, as I increase the, sh this makes the picture sharper, but it can be massively overused and abused if you're not careful. So as I'm dragging this slider, watch what starts to happen to that hair on the head. See, it's getting more pronounced, but see how the whole picture is starting to look for that really, that is overdone, you know, and you can also in increase all the, gee, talk about <laughs> go back five steps. So I'd be like, oh, overdone, well overcooked that. That looks terrible. Even the, like this is, sometimes people will use this too much and they put it in competitions. See, it's created digital noise all the way around it. If I zoom out to make it small, see how you can see it's all scratchy. So you want it to be the radius on about one, um, and the amount, I don't normally go over like 50. I just give it a little tiny boost. So they barely, you'd barely even notice that with your eye. What's even, it's certainly not like that, that big jump, just a tiny little bit of sharpening because otherwise it can really ruin your image and people can see straight away. It, it's not a technique. It, it, people think, oh, it looks a bit like a you know sketch. It doesn't, it looks like it's over sharpened. So this condor is beautiful. Lots of problems with this photo. Bright background drawing our eye away. There's a thorn bush thing dropping in, some bright areas in the foreground. He has, um, he's got something white stuck on his eye. And so for this one, straight away, first thing I do is a crop and I want to get rid of the tree. So I'm just going to crop at the tree. So I'm going to do the box. And actually, before I do that, what I could do, instead of cropping the tree, I could grab this bush here and just clone it over here because I'm going to crop down here. So get my clone tool, make it 100% opacity, massive big brush. Let's go 400. Okay, now you can see the brush size. Now it's giving me that. And I'm gonna to go to down here and start trying to make this fit, put it in from here. Oh, went up, I went up the tree, don't wanna go. Wherever I follow here is what will happen here. So you could see then, I actually, as I was going up, I went into the tree. So I started painting the tree on the tree. I need to move over further. So I'll go from here. And now when I go up, then I've just got to make sure, see this background is blurrier than this background. So I might even put a bit of this behind him a bit, just try and get away. There, I can see also repeated pattern. That flower and that little flower thing are the same. So I have to undo that because you can see it twice. So you want to get bits that you can't tell have been too far, went into the sky. Got to do smaller sections, that section and that section and that section. 
and just a tiny little bit at the top. And then in a minute, when I crop this, you'd be like, huh. Now in here, I've got some weird random plants just floating in the sky. So I'd have to deal with those. I might drop the opacity a little bit to do that. Get away with a bit more and just get rid of them again without, okay, it's not too bad at it for a quick job. And now when I crop, see I've cropped into that tree, but it's gone. Amazing, I love that. Because when I was shooting that, I was, I was, that was as far as my lens could zoom in. I was on the Jeep and I couldn't get closer. Now, pros and cons, I don't like this dark bush that's in the background here. And I don't like this bright white stuff in the foreground. I love this nice background back here. So I'm going to go with the 10 by eight inch crop and do a much shorter, fatter crop and try and just not have, and I still, I won't be losing too much res. I'm still, because this is a massive file size to start with. It's got this little bit of plant dropping in. That's fine, I'll get rid of him in a minute. Now I've got that. Now, I don't like things coming into my picture where you can't see where they come from. They're not anchored. This is floating in. So I'm going to do a very small clone brush. I'm going to clone that out. I'm going to grab a bit of this here and just run it up here. Oops, sorry, make my brush 100% opacity. I you can't see it. Uh, probably go from here. I've got to pick a similar sort of blurry background area and get rid of that. And now straight away, we can tell that and that's the same. So let's just get rid of that. Not anymore gone and even those light bits are distracting so I'm just cleaning them out and then what I would do for this guy as long as this isn't going in a wildlife thing where it has to be in absolute integrity of how it was shot I'd probably take that little white thing stuck on his eye off because it's a bit distracting and this brush is currently too big and if I do his eye you can see how that brush is way too big I'm going to make up here very small let's go for 28 and I'm just going to pick his eyelashes down here and photoshop them on top up here and see if I zoom out, if that looks looks a bit better. It's gone. Then I'll give him a bit of contrast. So make my contrast tool decent size, zoom in so you can see. And just contrast on his eye, all his dark shadows, give him a bit of contrast. Now he's just becoming a bit darker, but you can still see the detail. This brush is on 12% opacity, this um, little um, burn tool, I'm burning in the contrast. It's 12%, I normally use it around 10. 10 to 12. If you go to 100%, 100% darkens the area. Look at that. So that's yuck. So that's why I keep it at 12. I just use it very, very sparingly. Interestingly, um, if I'm editing on my laptop, which is not a BenQ monitor, if I basically come back and I re edit all my colors on my proper monitor because laptops are fraught. They're not designed necessarily to have um, be color calibrated and be perfect with what you need. Um, if I'm editing on that, 10% is too dark, I have to use 5%. It just shows how these devices can be way out unless they're proper calibrated bits of equipment. And I'm gonna make the background um, do that. And I'm gonna make the background a little bit darker as well. I'm gonna go with a big brush, 2,520. It's gonna cover like the whole thing and just do a whirl around there and a whirl around there. These bits in the front, give that a bit of contrast. I can actually dull down these bright bits if I want. I don't mind them too much. Actually, it's a bit too contrasty now. Go back a bit, do these, but without doing him. And that's the end result. He looks really sharp. He's got nice contrast and the horrible tree's gone from the other end. Um, I'm just gonna jump into the Q&A to see what you guys are asking me. Um, manual or autofocus? I use autofocus at all times. Um, that was from Raymond, thanks Ray. The manual focus for, I find for wildlife is just too slow. Um, I just cannot get them quick enough. So I use the autofocus. In the studio, I'm using a Canon 1DX Mark II and I use Tamron lenses. Um, I've just, well, for the last 12 months, I've been using a Sony A9 for my wildlife. And just today was the first time I used my A1 and it completely blew my mind. The burst mode on the A1, wow, the Sony A1 is next level. So I use autofocus on that. And the Sony, those Sony mirrorless cameras have um, animal eye tracking and human eye tracking puts a little square on the eye and wherever that subject moves its head, it can't get away. Uh, you still have to make sure the camera is fast enough, but even if they turn their head all the way around, the, the tracking dot stops and then jumps back on as their head comes around. Technology is next level. And I think that some of the other brands have um, incorporated that as well. Um, Raymond also said, never thought of using Bridge. Yeah, I think it's because I don't use Lightroom, so I don't catalog or anything. I just open in Bridge, quick selections, and I can see them all laid out together and away I go. Could you copy adjustments and use a series of photos as a basis for final tweaks? Yes, you can have like a, a, like this could be my green background and I can actually copy this and paste it into the elephant shot. You can have a set of files that are just backgrounds or skies and um, you know pretty much use those for other photos, drop in a sky if you have the skills to, to do that. Can you use a wet brush for the sky? 
Uh, I've never tried it. I use the coloring in brush or I use clone. It's just what I've used. Like I said, I'm a, there's a million ways to do it, but I'm a bit of a creature of habit. You mentioned your PC. Can you tell us what you have? Yes. So I have the, the BenQ monitor that's attached is the SW271C. It's built for photographers. Uh, 27 inches. I can't recommend it enough. My PC is worth $7,000. It's amazing. It's a Windows PC. And although it's hugely expensive and it's incredible, uh, when I first bought it, I had massive color contrast issues with my prints because it is not for photography. It's it's like the, the Mac computers that are very thin. It's the thickness of an iPad, 32 inches, and it can lay pretty much flat. And you, you can um, draw on it with a pen. Uh, which is amazing. It's super fast for what I need. I can open programs, but I have to um, have my BenQ plugged in because the Windows PC just is a Windows desktop. Uh, it just doesn't do the job for colors because it's designed around everything else. So you really need to make sure you do have a proper color calibrated monitor, no matter how much it costs. You know, mine has a great memory. It's super quick, but can't do this stuff. And I was getting pink color casts in all my client printing. Clients, dogs and cats were coming out pink had to keep, re keep reprinting and then I, you know, had to go on. That's that's actually the reason I actually bought my first BenQ ben PC was because I was just frustrated spending all this money on this computer. And, you know, we spend thousands. I've spent thousands on an A1. Yet why wouldn't I then spend thousands, you know, not thousands, BenQ monitors that actually, you know, there's some that start below $1,000. Why wouldn't we invest in good equipment for our image outcome? We spend money on cameras and lenses, but our computer, our monitor, is really, really important. Uh, it's an important tool in what we get as an output. Do I do layers and masks in a non-destructive way? That was asked by Andre. No, I'm really naughty, I don't. I open up the raw file and then I save it as a JPEG and I save an edited version and then I also add a logo to it, save that and then I shrink it down for social media and I save that. I don't use layers and masks unless I'm playing around with something more in depth, um, normally like creating a flyer or something for my business or things like that. So I know how to use them. And I know some people probably watching this going, oh my God, you've got to use layers and masks. But I don't, I just keep it super simple and I just edit off the front. Before we bring images into RAW, can we apply global changes once we've adjusted one image? You can, in RAW, you can batch in RAW. So what that means is by opening up your um, photos here in camera RAW, let's say I open these two in RAW. So I'm opening them in Bridge and I'm going to open them in the RAW converter. I'll just move the Q&A down here. I can actually select both of these and edit them both the same, you know, in one go. This is doing both changes to both photos because I've, I've highlighted both of them. I can make them both blue, and so you can see, and uh, you know, both exposed. And then when I open them, can I do that in Photoshop? Not as far as I know, and not that I do. I do it here. If I'm going to batch them, if I shot 10 photos of the same animal in the same light conditions and it needs to be made, they all need to be a bit warmer. I can just do that as a batch. So studio stuff for that, I can edit like that because I shoot in the same lighting conditions just on a black or white background. So it's very easy for me if they look a bit pink or blue or just to select them all and light and dark and make them not pink or blue. But I don't actually um, open them in Photoshop and then apply changes to all of them. I'm sure you possibly can. Someone who knows more about Photoshop than me can perhaps answer that, but I do it all in this raw editing software if I need to. Why not use content fill and aware? Good question, Robert. You can, I just don't. I just, I've always used the clone tool. I just like the control it gives me. And I've just, again, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. That's I stick to what I know. How do you remove chromatic aberration? There's, um, I, well, I probably do it the hard way. I normally like clone it out, but I'm pretty sure there's also tools. You can select it and you can minimize the color. Um, there's different tools in Photoshop that are probably even now in the current models because again remember I use five things and there's 500 things there's probably an option that can actually detect it and remove it for you or you can remove it and change it to a, a lot you know from pink to like a gray or the color it should be pretty sure that would be in there as well um without Lightroom if Alex had wanted to find all the Lightroom photos how would she do it good great question Fiona I save my my images in folders on my computer so they would be under Africa 2019 and then each day of shooting day one Lions, tigers, my tigers in Africa, lions, elephants, zebras, and then I know they're in there. Um, same for clients, files, I call them Murphy, Golden Retriever, Sharon Jones. So that, and then they're filed under um, each a year. Every year I have different folders that I use. Um, after working on image in Photoshop, I noticed you save as a JPEG. Do you ever save it as a PSD or TIFF? That's from Jane. Great question. I save it as a PSD if I'm, I've done a lot of edits and I'm still working on it. 
I don't normally save as a TIFF. I just save as a JPEG, and that's normally what I print from. Interestingly too, and some people will argue this point, but I do it all the time, so I'd argue against it. Um, if I crop a file to eight by 10, and you know, so a designer comes to me and someone says, we need that as a 20 by 30, I just open it up and I just resize it without losing any resolution and I can make it a 20 by 30 inch file. So all the files I show my clients in the studio are eight by 10, and if they want a 20 by 30, I just bump it up and I don't lose any resolution because the files are so big to start with. Um, what color space and calibration are you using? Good question, I think it's, um, I think I'm on Adobe RGB. Uh, would you use Lightroom for basic editing before you bring into Photoshop? You can, some people do. Some people download and catalog through Lightroom and then Lightroom has certain functionality and then go into Photoshop for some other functions that they you know, can't quite do. And they use both. Um, I just use Bridge. I don't know if a lot of people actually use Bridge. Um, people are always quite surprised when they see that I use it. It's not one of the main tools that people go to. I'm a Sony fan, Raymond, me too. I'm a massive convert. When I was doing my Quokka book, I really needed a camera with a flip screen. I couldn't, you know, they're very small animals. So I was a small kangaroo, you know, kind of very little. And to lay down on the ground and put my eye through the viewfinder of the Canon camera was just killing my body. So I needed a camera with a flip screen and I went and borrowed, um, I went and borrowed a Sony A7 and then I loved it and I just went and bought the A9. I got the A9 because I didn't necessarily need the video capabilities of the A7. And then I was using that and then someone said to me off the cuff, I think you need the A1 and I Googled it and went, oh no, I do. And then I ordered it and it's a big investment, but it is next level. It's like driving a spaceship for cameras. It's amazing. Um, did I say my PC is a BenQ? I have a Windows Surface desktop PC and my BenQ monitor is plugged into that. That was for um, Parham who asked that. So I edit on a BenQ. All my emails and you know other stuff I do on a PC, all my editing is done on a BenQ monitor. So um, it's super easy, it's set up next to each other. And I just drag my, um, when I turn them on, they're, they're synced, linked and synced. And I just drag my Photoshop screen over and it pops up on the BenQ monitor. And I edit on that because I know that I can trust that. I don't trust what I get on this screen I'm looking at at the moment. Um, thank you, Margaret said in ACR, you can remove chromatic aberration. So if anyone wants to look that up, um, ACR in, I assume that's in Photoshop, you can remove the chromatic aberration. Margaret also said, what Tamron lenses are you using? So in the studio, I mostly use a 24 to 70 mil Gen 2 lens because the subjects are fairly close to me. They're a foot away. For wildlife stuff with the Sony cameras, I've been using their 150 to 500 mil, big zoom. There's an equivalent in that for Canon and Nikon as well. It's a, it's a, um, I think it's a 100 to 600 in that. But 150 to 500, it's amazing. It's um, super fast in low light. So I mostly use that. There's also a 28 to 70, and uh, the numbers are different to the Canon, so it's hard to remember. And there's um, a 70 to 180 I use as well. But the beauty of the Sony lenses, apart from the big zoom, is I find that I can get like this far away from subjects, um, generally pretty close. So even today with the 70 to 180, I could get fairly close. The big zoom, I have to be a couple of meters away, but I really love that. Which calibrator do you recommend? Marie asked me, Marie, I cheat um, my photo lab comes and they put their spider on there for me and they do it for me. I don't, I stick to what I know and I'm always worried about you know, my stuff, my calibration. So I get them to come and do it for me. The SW271C comes calibrated out of the box and um, has a certain lifespan on that before you should get it done again. So I get my photo lab offer that as a service. They just come out and they run the spider over it and I'm good to go. And I don't know what model spider it is. You can buy them yourself. I'm sure it's really easy to do. Just plug in and go. It doesn't look that hard, but. Um, the new A1 was released today, go shopping. Yes, that's Raymond's advice, go shopping by the A1. Um, thank you, Jane, the removal of chromatic aberration confirming it's a slider in ACR, so you can get rid of that. The technology that we have these days is amazing. Not a question, the helping hand, turn off your caps lock to get the brush tool back to normal. Yeah, I don't have caps lock on, but <laughs> thank you, I will try. Uh, sometimes my Photoshop just plays up, it probably just needs a bit of a reset, but yeah, sometimes I, I normally, have the big tool showing. And if I don't, I kind of know how big it's going to be. That was from Gabrielle. So if you do find you can't see your tool, check your caps lock isn't on. Mine's not, and it still wasn't showing, but it sounds like um, that is something that can give it a bit of a fix. Um, and that looks pretty much like it. What's the advantage of the 271C over the 270? The 271's just the newest model, uh, extra, you know, both 27 inch. I know it's designed specifically for photographers. And BenQ is writing an answer in there for you right now because of the, the tech gurus. 
Um, I've had a number of Benku monsters over the years, um, bigger ones, smaller ones. Each time they bring one out, it, it's just incredible. You know, to see your pictures, how they should be seen, to see the full color range of that image, that orangutan photo particularly just blows my mind, that great big face that I had up in the presentation, um, just really blew my mind. Um, to see that for the first time on a proper color card rated screen, because I just wasn't getting it on this computer. Um, and that looks like it. Um, oh, ACR, Adobe Camera Raw. Okay, so you guys are saying in here, there is a slider that can remove chromatic aberration. It's probably this one, what's this? There you go. So <laughs> thank you, I learned something new. Uh, there's a little slider here. It's one, two, the six one across. It looks like a lens. It says lens, cor lens correction, remove chromatic aberration. Now, firstly, I should probably make the pictures not blue. And that is your hot tip. Um, before there were updates like this, you would have to do it yourself or send it to a retoucher to do and pay for it. So, I mean, the technology that we have at our fingertips, you know, if I'd actually got on Google, I could have um, figured that out. But I don't actually get it too often. I try not to shoot too often into really, really bright sky for that reason. Do I use back button, button focus when I shoot? So on the camera, there's a back button. Um, instead of having to half press the shutter and half focus, and you can back push the back button to lock on the focus super quick. Jane's asked if I use that. No, I don't. I've tried it, but I'm just so used to, after I've been shooting for about 15 years, so I'm just so used to half pushing to focus and keep pushing. I forget that's there to use, so I don't. Um, I also prefer not to use any of the auto tracking features in cameras. I use animal eye tracking, but any AI servo or anything like that where the camera jumps, I like to keep it on um, just one shot kind of focus and I, if it moves, I keep refocusing. Um, and But, you know, to be honest, I'm not really an action photographer. I'm a portrait photographer. So that may be why I'm not necessarily, you know, going for those big action shots. I'm going for just the kind of the face or the expression. Um, Raymond needs a 32 inch real estate uh, monitor for real estate video editing, I agree. Um, can you tell us the details of your laptop computer? Um, my laptop is also a Sony, oh, sorry, it's not Sony, it's a Windows um, Surface Pro, I think it is, and then I've got the Surface Pro desktop. It's very small, it's the size of an A4 piece of paper, it's like this big, and it, basically you can push a button and the, the screen can come off as a tablet. So that's what I take with me. Now I've got, again, it's not cheap, but I bought it because I wanted something when I'm traveling that can run through the, the, the number of images and the speed at which I'm opening stuff up to edit and all that sort of thing. I wanted something that could cope with that. Having said that though, I still have to come back when I travel and run them through my monitor because colors are never quite right on the laptop, um, even color calibrated. And Elle gave a five-star review, said, this has been excellent. You're wonderful, many thanks. You're excellent too. And Raymond, thank you too. Um, I really appreciate you guys stopping by and if you like this like I've got a million photos we can do this again I only got through a few but if you guys are keen BenQ will send you a little survey if you want more editing tips I could do this all day so if you want like a three hour one let me know and we'll sit there for hours and edit photos and knock it out of the park but just get out there and shoot enjoy what you do edit your pictures I hope there's been some good tips in there um, I'll quickly jump back to the last bit of my presentation um, if you'd like to find me on Facebook I have a Obviously, I have a business page uh, for my business, and I also have a private group. So you're all more than welcome to join that. It's called Inspire with Alex Kearns. It's got the link there, or if you start to Google Inspire, you'll find it. And I'd just like to say thanks to all of you for giving up your time today. I know BenQ really appreciate it, and I do too. And um, I'm run my presentation properly. Um, go with that. Um, thanks to BenQ. Special mention to Grace. She's my right-hand person at BenQ and she's put a lot of work into this and always gets everything teed up and makes sure it runs smoothly. So thanks to her. And here's my contact details if you would like to find me. I'm open to any questions about monitors. If it's a tech thing, I'll get the answer for you from BenQ. Because again, being self-taught, I know how I use things. I don't always know the ins and outs of how they work. Um, but my websites are on there, my contact details and my Facebook. Um, and Again, open to questions. If you've got them, please send them through. I'll answer anything about lenses, editing, whatever you want to know. And yeah, have a great day. Okay, and I'll just um, share my screen back. I just need you to stop sharing your screen, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can, everybody, can you see that? You can see it, right? Uh, hang on a second, I just jumped off the... Just lost my camera. Yes, I can. Okay. So thank you again, Alex, for this great session. We hope everyone has gotten some useful tips from Alex herself. And I think everybody is looking forward to another or a further um, editing session with Alex as well.
So thank you for taking your time out to join us. This will actually be our last and final webinar for this year. So I hope to see you all back next year. As mentioned in the beginning, this session was also recorded and will be available to watch um, early next week. I'll be sending out an email with the details on where you can um, rewatch the session again. But for now, if you need to learn, learn more with our photography monitors, you can visit our website and or follow our social media to keep up to date. We currently have received many inquiries about our photography monitor, especially um, the stock. If you would like to get your hands on one or view a demo of our photography range of monitors, you can visit our specialized resellers, um, Image Science, George's Camera, Camera Electronic or Specular, or you can visit our online shop uh, from the BenQ website. There's also an option um, on our website called Notify Me. So if there's any stock that you are actually looking for that may not be available at the moment, we can contact you when it is actually back in stock. So if your, and, uh, if your questions were not answered, please feel free to reach us, uh, contact us from this email, um, BenQ, uh, bqaumarcom at benq.com and we'll endeavor to provide a response to you as early as possible. Now, don't forget to help us fill out this, the quick survey and provide your feedback on what would you like to see for the next webinar with Alex and hope to see you all again. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks Grace. Bye. Bye.